It was a bright, beautiful autumn day in the mid-1980s, not un unlike today. And I was probably about 13 years old. And it was a Saturday, and there was absolutely nothing in my world going on that day. And I remember waking up at the god-awful hour of probably 10 a.m. <laughs> and reaching over to the phone located next to my bed and picking it up and making a phone call. And I called a young girl I knew from school. And I remember the conversation very well, actually. Her mom answered the phone, handed it to her, and I said, hello. She said, hello. What are you doing? Just woke up. Oh, me too. What, what are you doing today? Nothing. Oh, me too. <laughs> this conversation, in about the same meter and depth, went on for about an hour. <laughs> and about an hour and a half into this moving, life-changing conversation, I got this idea. I said, how long have you ever been on the phone with a boy before? She said, I think this is close to my limit. And I go, you want to see how long we can stay on the phone? She said, yeah, all my friends are skiing today. And I said, mine too. And she said, well, then let's do this. And for the next 12 hours, <laughs> I tied up my parents' telephone line. <laughs> and I look back on that at this point in my life, and I've asked myself on many occasions, why in the world would a 13-year-old boy spend 12 hours on the phone with a girl he's really not even that interested in? And part of it's because we as a species have been designed and we have become a verbal first species. From the history of our species until today, we have traditionally been verbal first in our communications. The earliest writings that we have on record are from about the 26th century BC from both Egypt and Samaria. Before that, we have no evidence of writing. Yet, somehow, we communicated. Even to this day, half of the world's known languages have no written text. They're just verbal. And we as a society communicate first verbally all the time. Everything that we do in our society has been geared towards verbal first communications. But technology is changing all of that. To illustrate that, we need to take a trip down memory lane. If you go back 25 years or so, when personal communications started to change through computers, we were able for the first time to talk to people around the world for free via a computer. And at first, it was all via text. Remember AOL Instant Messenger? You've got mail. <laughs> text. Fast forward a few years, and people started actually doing things online. I was a part of a generation who started using text-based communications online well before the internet. When you dial into another computer locally in your community and you would jump on what's called a bulletin board. That makes me really ancient right now if you're a tech nerd. Fast forward a few years and things like Tumblr, MySpace, Facebook come into the picture. And even predating those, teenagers started texting one another. Remember the stories about parents getting a $2,000 bill because their kid was texting? <laughs> it seems ludicrous today. But if you fast forward a few years even after that, you find technologies like Facebook Messenger, Snapchat, WeChat, Line, SMS, Text-based communications are changing the way that our society communicates. My son is 19 years old, and that makes him a part of the very first generation ever. The year that he was born is the first generation ever who will never remember the world without the internet. Why is that important? Because as we grow, like I when I was a young man, and we start to communicate with people outside of our immediate families, it typically has been done via verbal communications. Those times where we learn to express ourselves and communicate and share ideas, hopes, dreams, that stuff has traditionally all happened verbally. Our grandparents went to sock hops. 
They went to community dances. They went to school functions. Our parents went to other events, things like cruising the strip. In fact, as I was preparing for this, I was reminded of a great commercial from the 1970s for a product called Mr. Microphone. It was this great cordless microphone that played through any radio. And the tagline of the whole thing was, hey, good looking, we'll be back to pick you up later. <laughs> it's an example of verbal first communications, young people learning to express and be who they are as individuals through verbal first communications. About 15 to 16 years ago, when text messaging became popular, that started to change. The rise of AOL Instant Messenger and Facebook, those things all changed the way that young people are developing because it stopped being verbal first and it started to be text first. For the first time in the history of our society, people are learning to communicate from a very young age outside of their immediate family in the most formative years of their lives in a text-based manner. And I really think that there are going to be four major changes that we as a society are not very prepared for. But I think after today, maybe you'll be a little more prepared for them. The first one is that this device right here, this always-on, always-tethered device that constantly gives us access to the internet, is going to actually cause some problems for our society because of text-based communications. There's going to be a technology and a communications gap unlike anything we have ever seen. See, traditionally, a communications gap was between different generations. Parents didn't know how to talk to their kids. Kids didn't know how to talk to their parents. But most of it was based on vernacular. Here's the problem. Vernacular can be easily taught. And all of us are familiar with the memes on the internet that show grandpa trying to send a text message to his grandkids or the horrific postings we've all had from our grandma on Facebook. <laughs> Those are the kind of gaps that we are going to see in communication, but I would pose to you that it's going to be even worse than that. See, some of us grew up in a family where we were affluent enough to be able to afford a device like this. And our friends did too. And so as text-first communications become more and more prevalent, if I have one of these devices in my hands at all times, it becomes easy for me to keep up with my peers. It becomes easy for me to develop the way that the vast majority of people are. But what happens to cultures and societies and neighborhoods where you can't afford a device like this? Imagine a radical shift in a language, in a nation, and you not being able to afford the lessons for it. I really believe that text-first communications are going to be the equivalent of a state-sponsored shift in languages that no one ever actually sponsored. So imagine that you grow up as a young person and do not have the ability to communicate in a text-first manner the way that everyone else in your generation does. Imagine that you're now part of a different generation who have to go back into the workforce later in life. And text-first communications is going to be the way that the majority of people expect you to be able to communicate. Ask yourself right now, how would you fare in a job interview that was conducted entirely via text message? How would you communicate with somebody via text message sarcasm, irony, subtle flirting? One of the first problems our society is going to see that we are not prepared for is a giant, giant gap in communications that we have never experienced in the history of our society. I think the second thing that we're going to see as a societal shift is going to be a change in brain development and brain chemistry. The research behind what goes on in a forming brain is fascinating. And in fact, most of the conventional education that we have is a verbal first communication method. We have been brought up in this, we understand that, and we've developed styles around verbal first communications. But what happens when your primary mode of communication is text first, but your teacher's is verbal first? Can you imagine having never heard someone talk outside of your mom for more than five minutes and having to sit in a classroom and listen to a lecture drone on and on and on? You'd be texting your friends. This is the most boring thing ever. And what happens to young people's brains as they begin to develop in a society where everything is expected to be verbal, yet they're constantly being bombarded with text? Moreover, add to that all the stimuli of what happens when you are constantly bombarded with notifications, 
text messages, buzzes, sounds, our brain actually goes into a fight or flight mode every time we are notified by our phone. What happens to the chemistry of a young person's brain who are being stimulated in a way they've never been stimulated before, whose fight or flight responses are being stimulated in a way never before, and on top of that, their brain is developing under a text first scenario? We don't know. We won't know for quite some time. I think the third thing that we will see as a shift in our society is a new rise of rock stars. Now, I know this sounds kind of crazy and who cares, but hear me out on this. We are going to see a new celebrity unlike anything we've seen in the history of our world. See, traditionally, the great people of our time that we think of as communicators are the great orators, the Winston Churchills of this world, the John F. Kennedys, the Martin Luther King Juniors, the Steve Jobs we are going to see the rise of a new rock star that is a text-first communicator. And in fact, we're already starting to see glimpses of this. Put your politics aside for 10 seconds and think about this. Our current president arguably would never have been elected without Twitter. The American people hold more sway in what he says via a text on Twitter, 140 characters, oftentimes, than what he says verbally. That's just a glimpse. Because the new rock stars of our society aren't just people who can play instruments or act on a stage or have a beautiful face. They're the people who can code. Oh, that's text-based as well. They're the people who actually have built empires on a text-based platform. Think about the Mark Zuckerbergs of this world. Think about Steve Jobs, Elon Musk. All of them built an empire on a text-first platform. The fourth thing I think that we're going to see through a device like this is the business of text is going to change the way that we function as a society. This week, um, I decided it was time for me. I'm a runner, an avid runner, and I love running, but my, I'm also getting old. And I decided that I would save my knees some trouble, and I decided to order a bike this week. So I went on Amazon, thinking how hard is it to order a bike? I have a budget. And I clicked on Amazon, and I saw that I needed to find out what size of bike I needed. I didn't know there were bike sizes. So I clicked a few more things, and I went to a website that said, here's a size chart. And I picked out the size, and I picked out the color, and I went click, 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 and three days later, it was at my house. And I got home that day, and I pulled in my garage, and in my garage is this box. And I got so excited. It's my bike. And I walk in. And it hit me, this bike now has to be put together. <laughs> I don't have the skills to do that. I have to call somebody. Really? And I had to call a local bike shop and like talk with some random person and make an appointment to come in? And I found myself frustrated because I didn't want the human interaction. Why couldn't I go on my phone and click, click, click and have someone show up at my house and go, See, there's an issue in our country, and you could call it an issue or you could call it an opportunity, depending on if you're an optimist or a pessimist. But there's a law in our country that corporations are required to maximize the amounts of profits that they generate for their shareholders. And in doing so, oftentimes companies will make decisions on business based on that premise. So the less interaction that I have to give my customers with another human being, the more money I can make because I have to hire less employees, and so my profit margins rise. And we are actually going to see, I believe, in our society, a movement to eliminate human interaction from commerce. You're seeing this even now. My episode with Amazon is a great example of this. We see around us a, a peeling back of the interaction that we have with other human beings, and it's moving towards a text-first system. And as a society, we aren't prepared for the ramifications of that because we've never been here before. So when it comes to things like communication gaps, brain changes, and that's pretty important, text-based stars and text-based commerce, why does that matter to any of us? Is it good? Is it bad? Well, I would wage to you that it's neither good nor bad, it's amoral. It just is. In fact, I think that people who fight against it, those 
hippies running around yelling, we need to sit down and sing Kumbaya, are probably going to be the outcasts. Because it just is going to happen. Our children are going to grow up doing it. Young people are going to be more text-based than they've ever been before, and there's no point in fighting it. But I do think that it deserves some attention from us as a society. It deserves some intentionality around our thinking. And I think more importantly, it deserves us deciding in advance what it is that we value. Because at the end of the day, all verbal communications or text-based communications or young men laying in bed on a Saturday morning reaching for the phone comes down to one thing, human connectedness. People need and want and desire to be connected with their peers. People need and want and desire to become one with the community. And regardless of the technology that you use or how important you think it is, at the end of the day, that's what's most important. Is that we as a society decide it doesn't matter what technology happens, it doesn't matter what rules happen, we will, at the end of the day, hold our peers, our friends, our communities more important than any single technological revolution. And that's one of the things that I think as a society we are prepared for. Thank you very much.